Okay, this is a reaction video uh, following on my German theme, top 10 World War II, World War II sites to visit in Berlin. Now, he, he's standing in front of the Reichstag, I know that, and I have been to Berlin, and I'm continuing on my German theme because I have, you know, I've seen a lot of videos on Germany, and I kind of missed the place and would love to go back, and I will go back. Uh, but uh, I am a fan of World War II, or not a fan of World War II, but I do watch a lot of World War II videos. But uh, this would be rather interesting. Top 10 World War II sites to visit in Berlin. Please click like, share, and subscribe for them. And they're on the site tours. And then please click like, and subscribe, share, and subscribe for me. Let's see what this is all about. Hello, and welcome to the On the Front Tours channel. On the Front Tours. A place where we discuss all things World War II, and I bring you to these sites today. My name is Matt, and on today's episode, our very first episode on this channel, I'm bringing you my top 10 World War II sites to visit here in Berlin. Now I know what you're thinking, there is a lot of history here in this city and you would be right. So for today's list, I've used three criteria. The first one is that these sites need to be not only relevant for history buffs, but also for those just looking to learn more about the Second World War. Secondly, these sites need to tell the story of the Third Reich from beginning all the way to its eventual collapse. And thirdly, these sites need to all be within walking distance so that if you decide to join or follow in my journey today, you'll easily be able to get to these sites. Now, with that being said, let's just jump into site number one, the Reichstag. Yeah, the Reichstag, you can actually see when you get off the train, when, it, when we pulled in the train station to Berlin, uh, when you got went outside, at least when I went out there, uh, the Reichstag was right there. We walked right in front of it, just like he is right there. Really a beautiful. That's 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 the the, the if I'm not, not mistaken the seat of uh, German government. Commissioned in 1871 by Otto von Bismarck, the Reichstag was the unifying symbol of power here in Germany, forming the German Empire. The building, however, was not very important to the Nazi Party. Shortly after their election on the 30th of January 1933, the building was completely destroyed by fire. The party itself was able to leverage this tragedy in order to bring about sweeping reforms to solidify their grasp on power. After this, the building was left in a very dilapidated state and not used by the Nazis in particular. Fast forward 12 years, of course, and you had the Soviet army knocking on the door of Berlin, who saw the Reichstag as their crowning jewel. The fighting for the building was extremely bitter. And battle scars can still be seen in the building today, despite extensive renovation efforts. The building would fall to the Soviets on the 30th of April, 1945. After the war, the building would be left in a further dilapidated state until German reunification in the 1990s, where it would once again unify Germany politically. Uh, yeah, that's important to remember is... Uh, he kind of went over it. Maybe he'll go over it later in the video. If you, if, if you were born in 1990 or beyond that, I really feel like my niece was born in 1997. She grew up with the unified Germany. Uh, there's one country, Germany, but Germany was split in two, the East Germany and the West, East Germany and West Germany. And so was Berlin, East Berlin and West Berlin. So if you were in West Berlin, you were in the right in the middle of, of East Germany, uh, the city of Berlin, because uh, uh, Berlin is on the east side of the country. Uh, it was a country that was, it was a city that was divided, and they had a wall there. But they, let's, let's let them continue. Uh, and it reopened as the German seat of parliament in 1999. Symbolism plays a huge part in every country's history, but no site is quite important to Germany uh, as our next site, number two, the Brandenburg Gate. And the Brandenburg Gate was also something that was also close by. It's not too far from the Reichstag. And looking at it from where he is right now, and I, my, I, I was there on... I, the reason I remember this date so well, because it it's my brother's birthday, it was June 14, 2006, and the Fan Fest wasn't too far from the uh, Brandenburg Gate as well, and it was it's an amazing structure, uh, and uh, I really, really, it was, it was very impressive to see up close. Undoubtedly the national symbol for Europe, the Brandenburg Gate, constructed in 1791, was the focal point for much of Nazi propaganda and ceremonies, the most notable of which was probably Hitler's 50th birthday on the 20th of April 1939. The street under then Linden was lined with Nazi flags and pillars adorned with swastikas and Nazi eagles. The Brandenburg Gate today, however, tells a very different message, one of unity and one of freedom not just here for Germany, but I think also in the broader context of Europe and even the world. 
As countries' histories evolve, the symbolism around it changes with the people and its morality. But no symbol has quite changed as much over time as our next site, number three, the new guardhouse. Built in 1813, the new guardhouse was designed to commemorate the war of liberation against Napoleon. Reconverted in 1931 in commemoration to the fallen German soldiers of the First World War. That doesn't look familiar to me. I don't believe I went and saw the new guardhouse. Or the site was used extensively by the Nazis to hold parades and regular changing of the guard ceremonies, which would see large crowds flock to the site. After the war, the site was rededicated to the victims of fascism and militarism by the East German government. The remains of an unknown soldier and unknown concentration camp victim were buried under an internal flame surrounded by soil brought in from varying battlefields and concentration camp sites. After German reunification, the remains of the unknown soldier and concentration camp victim remain buried today, but under the sculpture of the mother. The Kathakolvit statue depicts a mother embracing her dead son, silent in pain. This moving monument in the centre of busy Berlin stands as Germany's central monument to victims of war and tyranny. Where does tyranny begin? Perhaps we can discover a little bit of this in our next site, site number four, Babelplatz. On May 10th, 1933, members of the Nazi Student Union gathered here at Babelplatz, adjacent the prestigious mm -hmm. Humboldt University. I believe this is where they did that big book burning you sometimes see in some of the documentaries. May 10th is actually my sister's birthday. So I got my brother, I remember my brother, but he mentioned my sister's birthday. But um, yeah, I think this is, this is uh, someplace that I do remember seeing as well in an action against the un-German spirit. Both students and professors burned up to 25,000 volumes of literature in an event that would become known as the burning of the books. Now what makes this event even more disturbing is that it wasn't actually organized by the Nazi party themselves. Yeah, it wasn't, it, the Nazis didn't organize it, but the Nazis uh, supported it. And I, I believe seeing, heard, seeing a documentary, uh, Goebbels, uh, uh, really, really uh, liked it and, and used it to uh, for, for propaganda. That's what that's what he did. But rather independently by the students, looking to capitalize on the situation, Joseph Goebbels quickly made his way down here and gave an impromptu but very fiery speech. No to decadence and moral corruption. Yes to decency and morality and family and state. I consign to the flames the writing of Heinrich Mann, Ernst Gleisner, Erich Kusner. Book burnings occurred nationwide with students organizing themselves using the national radio system. The books to be burnt were chosen by a man called Wolfgang Hermann, who shortlisted 12 volumes that he deemed to be un-German. Both public and private bookshelves were plundered in this nationwide action. The monument today depicts a sunken library showing what is missing with the ominous quote from Heinrich Hein. That was but a prelude where they burn books, they will ultimately burn people as well. The word yeah, I mean, the, I, I get that some books are controversial. I get that uh, things like that, some people want to destroy literature and things like that but he's right you know you know th 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 this was this was a uh some i remember i do remember seeing this place here uh uh th th this this is one of those things that whenever you see in the documentaries you shake your head can't believe it's going on but some of the stuff seems like it's going to come about around in this day and age too we, we see that sometimes in the united states where people are trying to whitewash history or, or trying to take uh historical events and, and, and trying to erase them or putting modern day belief systems on past uh, past incidents as though that justifies uh, you know destroying history. The words of Heinrich Hein could not have proven more true with the outbreak of the Second World War and site number five, the Soviet Memorial. By the summer and I did see the Soviet Memorial. It's st it was still there in 2006. I imagine it's still there now. Um, and the reason it's, it's still there is because uh, when reunification happened, or when the fall, when when that was done, th th there was a deal made that uh, this had to remain. So this Soviet Memorial, which is a memorial to the Soviets from World War II, still remains. I this this is n not not too far from the Brandenburg Gate. In summer of 1941, the German army seemed invincible. Their use of blitzkrieg tactics quickly saw them overcome and conquer all of Western mainland Europe. Now overconfident, 
Hitler turns his attentions to what he believes to be the true enemy of National Socialism, the Soviet Union. However, this would be their undoing, and Hitler's dreams of a thousand-year Reich would come to a bloody end on the gates of Stalingrad. In the following three years of brutal fighting, the Soviet Red Army would... What I remember is Hitler had what, what, two, two million, three million troops attack the Soviet Union, and you know, pretty much uh, had a had had a good go of it. And but uh, I think Leningrad is where the uh, where 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 it, where it faltered, and uh, I think the Soviets had more men in reserve from Siberia than Hitler had accounted for. Hitler wasn't a very smart uh, military, military technician, and I'm no historian by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, they turned it back on Hitler, and before he knew it, you know, the Soviets were uh, would, would capture Berlin. We reached the outer limits of Berlin on the 20th of April, 1945, and the Battle of Berlin was set to begin. The fighting for the city would be one of the bloodiest of the entire war, with the Soviets losing some 80,000 troops, 2,000 of which are buried on the grounds here behind me. The memorial here is one of three memorials we have spread throughout the city. This memorial, however, was the first one that the Soviets erected using recycled material from Hitler's very own Reich's chancellery. Battle scarring can still be seen in the monument today. With the end of the Second World War in May of 1945, both the Soviets and the Allies were slowly coming to grasp with the atrocities committed by the Nazis. This brings us to site number six, the memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe. And this is another place that we saw. We weren't able to go in and, uh, and take a look at this as much as I would have liked to. But yeah, this was, you, you, there's actually, a, if I'm not mistaken, memory serves, you could go down some stairs and go underneath and see some of these things here. I'm not sure. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm going based on, you know, 16 year memories. Um, cause there's a way you can go inside. I think it's underground, but I did remember seeing this. We, we couldn't do it because we were, we were, look, we were staying in Frankfurt. It takes four hours to get from Frankfurt to Berlin. And, uh, it was starting to get dark. Well, it wasn't starting to get dark. It was starting to get late. Located in the heart of Berlin, this memorial serves as a striking place of remembrance. Designed by New York architect Peter Eisenman in 2005, this memorial is unique, not only in its design, but also that there's been no official meaning dedicated to the memorial itself. Open on all four sides, the monument consists of 2,711 concrete pillars, all of varying sizes. Running on an inward slope on uneven ground gives the visitor a sense of instability and uncertainty. What I think makes this monument so special is that it's up to the individual to experience this monument for themselves and derive their own meaning, resulting in this monument having longer lasting effects on the visitor themselves. Located a short distance from here is the racial mastermind behind the Nazi racial policy. And maybe you can't go in underneath it or something like that. I just, I just, there's a part of the remembers that when we went, because I remember seeing this. This is, this is, you'll, you'll never forget this. You know what this was about. Uh, but I do remember uh, there was a, a, a woman sitting saying there, and you could go, it looked like there were some stairs you could go down in there. If I'm, if I'm mistaken, let me know, please. But I do remember seeing something like that. Politics and where he would spend his final days. Site number seven, the Fuhrer bunker. Now, I did not go to the, the Fuhrer bunker. And if I understand correctly now, it's no longer really in existence now. I think it's more a parking lot, but they do have a, um, a plaque there that uh, commemorates it. Located under what was the site of the Reichskanzlerie or Hitler's main office was the Fuhrer bunker. And it was here that Hitler would spend his final days. What is nothing more than a car park today would see the closing of what was one of the 20th century's most brutal and bloodiest dictatorships. Hitler, along with his staff, moved to the complex on the 16th of January 1945, seldom leaving the safety of the bunker only to attend military conferences in the rooms of what remained of the Reich's Chancery or to walk his dog Blondie. Hitler made his final journey to the top on the 20th of April 1945. He's making some, uh, you know, talk to some Hitler youth and giving them encouragement. But um, uh, one of the things about uh, Hitler uh, I saw a video one. It, it put it, it was one of these videos that said "What if?" and it said, 
what if hit you know they, they put a scenario that hitler wasn't able to kill himself and he was captured by the soviets and what would have happened if he was captured by the soviets there is absolutely no way in the world hitler would have allowed himself to be captured by the soviets i mean he would he would have I mean, that that to me that that that's that's a complete implausible maybe by the west it's possible but certainly not by the soviets that was to me i i find that hard to believe that even if you were to even attempt something like that to see what what a, a what if that 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 that's one of those things that's well i don't think it would have ever happened he would have you know given himself the most painful death before he would have uh allowed himself to be captured by the Soviets. Five for his 56th birthday, where he awarded iron crosses to the boy soldiers of the Hitler Youth, the only ones that remained to defend his thousand year empire. As the Soviets drew closer to the complex, the situation in the bunker became more and more desperate, with Hitler's ramblings of wonder weapons and moving fictitious units around on the map in hopes of still winning the war became more and more delusional. But as time passed, Hitler realized his time was all but up. Out of acknowledgement for her loyalty, Hitler would marry his long-term mistress, Eva Brown, on the 29th of April, 1945. The next morning, on the 30th, they would both commit suicide. According to reports from the bunker, the bodies were carried out, wrapped in blankets and placed into a bomb crater where they were incinerated. Upon Hitler's orders, he was adamant that he didn't want to have his body discovered by the Soviets. As he and the reason why he didn't want that was because he'd seen what happened to Mussolini and Mussolini's mistress. He was fearful his remains would be put on open display. And still today, his remains have never been recovered. So what remains? There was actually a, a, a documentary or a documentary series called Hunting Hitler, which said that Hitler may have escaped and um, uh, you know, went, to, went to South America. And there's some compelling evidence there, but not, 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 not to the point where I believe that Hitler actually escaped his fate of the political institutions of Hitler's Third Reich today. One of the best preserved examples we have is our next site, number eight, the Ministry for Aviation. Upon its completion in 1936, the Ministry for Aviation was the largest office complex in Europe. Designed by architect Ernst Sigerbill, it was typical of National Socialist intimidation architecture as it dominates the surrounding landscape. The ministry, under the command of Hermann Goering, was designed to support the Luftwaffe or the German Air Force. Goering was a fighter pilot in World War One, a very decorated fighter pilot in World War One. Um, I did not see this place. I, if I did, I don't remember it. But uh, still, <laughs> from the look of it, like I guess from what I remember, Berlin, it does it, is, it does look impressive. With aircraft and to design and develop new aviation technologies. The Luftwaffe was instrumental in early German military success at the outbreak of World War II. The ministry itself would eventually collapse in late 1945 due to a lack of resources, fuel and material. After the war, the building survived in remarkable condition, only receiving minor damage and would serve as the council for the minister of the East German government. Today, the building serves as the German tax office. Our next site also instrumental. Oh, there's another reason to hate it: the German tax office. Into the administration of the Nazi regime is the Topography of Terror site number nine, a site of remembrance today. The Topography of Terror was once the location of the headquarters of the SS under the command of Heinrich Himmler. The complex housed the SS Central Command. Heinrich Himmler uh, did a, did survive the war and tried to escape. Cut out, uh, shaved his mustache and went on the run. They eventually was captured. But before they could execute him or put him on trial, he had a cyanide capsule and was able to kill himself before then. And Gestapo and SS Secret Service. Combined, the complex formed a house prison. I did not see this place in Berlin. Prison where opponents of the Nazi regime were interrogated, tortured and executed. Who were these opponents? They were anybody who dared speak against the Nazi regime. Even those who were dobbed in by friends and neighbours for speaking ill of the party in private or in social engagements. The Gestapo arrested some 15,000 uh, German civilians. And where do we hear about things like that? If you speak ill of the regime, you'll get thrown into, you know, you know, taken away and thrown into a prison, maybe executed. We hear that in North Korea.
civilians and brought them here and to other Gestapo complexes to be interrogated before being sent off to concentration camps. All that remains of the site today is the basements where the opponents themselves were interrogated. Above, we can also see what remains of the Berlin Wall. Actually, I may, ha I may have seen this place. Uh, I'm looking in the background there, and I'm seeing some some uh, uh, I'm seeing some uh, landmarks that I do remember seeing, and I do remember going uh, through uh, uh, and seeing places where they ha still have names of people who were. Uh, killed by the uh, killed at the wall. Um, I took pictures of those, and then I went home and I did some research. And the names of the people that I had that they had memorials to were people who were killed at the Berlin Wall. The site also serves as a warning as to what can happen if challenge goes unchecked, if power goes unchecked. On the bottom, we have the remains of the Nazi regime, and on top, we have what remains of the Soviet communism. Also on the site, we have the Topography of Terror Museum, a fantastic museum that is free to go into. And if you're anything like me and you love to read everything, the museum will take you a solid three to four hours to get through. It was here, though, that Nazi terror was administrated. But how was it carried out? In our next site, we get a little glimpse into just that. Site number 10, Anhalter Bahnhof. A relatively hidden site, Anhalter Bahnhof is one of the best locations to get up close and personal with... Yeah, I did not see this place, but I would have loved to. And when I go back to Berlin, I will find this place. The ruins of Hitler's Third Reich. Built in 1841, Anhalter Bahnhof was Berlin's largest and by far most opulent train station, with some 44,000 passengers passing through its doors every single day. Unfortunately destroyed by Allied bombing during the war, all we've been left with today is the front facade. So why is it here? Unfortunately, Anheuser Bahnhof was one of three train stations used to deport the 55,000 Berlin Jewish community members. Yeah, I was about ready to say, why would it be there? Probably because it's a memorial for the for the Jewish for the Jews who were sent to concentration camps. as one of the train stations. That's such again one of the big tragedies. You know. I love Germany. I will I will take it to my grave that Germany is one of the best countries that I've ever visited, one of the best places I've ever gone to. But it's one thing that, you know, it, 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 what what happened, what Hitler uh, did during World War II and the reason you have these memorials, it's such it's such tragedy. And I, I don't I certainly don't reflect it upon the people of Germany today, uh, but it is something that is I, I do understand. Uh, is a stain on on the country and uh it, it it's it's it is something i will have to take a look at when i go back to berlin some nine and a half thousand berlin jews pass through the gates here in small groups of 50 to 100 into specially designated passenger cars so as not to arouse suspicion but they were then sent to theresienstadt in nazi occupied czechoslovakia and from there sent on to concentration camps the modern Anhalter Bahnhof finds itself in the underground section of the Berlin S-Bahn today. And if you decide to follow my list here, it is a great place to end as this station will take you straight back into central Berlin. So that's my list of top 10 World War II sites here in Berlin. If you agree with me or you think I've left out any sites, please let me know in those comments down below. If you're interested in learning more about these sites, please consider downloading my free World War II top 10 guide found in the description below where I dive into further detail. If you liked the video today, please consider smashing that like button. And if you would like more content from me, please subscribe to my YouTube channel and I'll see you next time on the front. Yeah, this was a very good uh, web, very good uh, video to watch. Uh, and yeah, please click like, share and subscribe for on the front. And some of these places I've been to, some of them I have not, but I will, now that I have this to go by, I probably will go back to, like I said, I, I, will, I do want to go back to Germany, the friendliest people, the most wonderful country I've ever been to, most wonderful country I've ever visited, not, notwithstanding the United States. And then, then hopefully next year, I'd like to be able to go to France. I'd like to be able to go to Poland. I'd like to be able to go to places like that and see more of Europe than I've already seen. But yeah, please click like, share, and subscribe for him. And please click like, share, and subscribe for me and have a good rest of your day. Thanks for watching the video.